So good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, I know that there might be some disappointment because you were expecting Eftimia Leku, who is uh, a colleague of us, but unfortunately uh, she called sick and so she can't be there and I'm replacing her. So in order not to get confusion, I am not Eftimia Leku, and, uh, but I thank the uh, organizer and especially uh, Gael uh, for uh, giving me the chair of this second part of the day about embodying European citizenship through values. So in French, incarner la citoyenneté européenne par les valeurs. And the first session, so the one I'm chairing now, is about the citizens' practices as a means of reappropriation of EU values. So we are supposed to start with uh, Ms. Remlinger, but as uh, she's expecting some uh, devices and some uh, slides on the PowerPoint, we're going to just switch uh, immediately to Professor Nino Foster, who is uh, from the Polytechnic University of Hauts-de-France, so basically Valenciennes, and uh, <laughs> it's a bit complicated, but uh, it's the, the magnificent University of Valenciennes, and she's going to bring us the warmth of the north. Yes, it happens. And she's going to talk about the litigious path, a new form of citizen appropriation of union values, question mark. So the floor is yours, dear colleague. Thank you, thank you very much. I want to thank, uh, ah, sorry, yes. OK, yes. So thank you very much. <coughs> I want to thank Gael Marti for inviting me um, to, um, to present this uh, subject, who is a little bit difficult, or I want to say a little bit, um, with a lot of contradictions. So since Van Gennen loss, vile, vile, sorry, vigilance of the part of individuals has always been a central instrument for ensuring that the member state and the European Union respect the right recognized by the Union. This observation is undeniable when it comes to the union's value. Also, by their nature, values are a legal instrument of varying scope and effectiveness when it comes to the citizens' right to assert them before judges. This study starts from the premise, which is open to debate, that values are not limited to an ethical, philosophical concept, devoid of a legal dimension. On the contrary, they constitute a normative constitutional framework, framework which sits at the summit of the union legal system and define it. So that its institution and the member state are accountable to the citizen for respecting its protection. According to this definition, it would be illogical to speak of legal values if their protection were not guaranteed and their viola violation sanctioned. To the end, there are no non-contentious legal actions reserved for political institution and contentious legal actions, which in addition to being open to institutions, are also open to citizens. In this presentation, we will be studying at this legal remedy as used by citizens. Litigation is a way for citizens to help protect the value of the union. They are used as, above all, a subjective purpose, since they are intended to strengthen an argument. <coughs> this can be seen in the extent to which citizens invoke the values in support of the protection of their rights. This our cheapness or appropriation is defined here as the fact of adapting values to a specific use, the protection of citizen rights. Nevertheless, the invocation of values by citizens are also more objective consequence. It involves citizens in a movement to protect the common and fundamental interest of the union. Litigation appears to be a way for citizens to take part in the debate on the content 
of values. Indeed, litigation is a forum for discussion and debate protected by various procedural, procedural rules which enable citizens to put forward their own interpretation of the meaning of values. At the end, it's the Court of Justice that uh, uh, have the, the ultimate word, but they, they can, can propose, propose their yeah. interpretation. This objective purpose helped to clarify the term of citizen appropriation. Citizen appropriation is not synonymous with the use of the values by, by European citizens. It can be understood more broadly as the civic use of a legal means to protect values. In this sense, the notion of citizen appropriation is not limited to European citizens, but is open to any litigant, even if they are not the ones who mainly use it. However, when they invoke values, it is as individual rather than as European citizens. The concept of citizen and litigant are not identical a priori. The litigant refers to the holder of the right to bring an action before a judge, while the citizen refers to the holder of the right to take part directly or indirectly in a decision relating to the political community to which he or she belongs. However, as a litigant non-citizen of the union sometimes take part in the decision of the political community, for example, with national of third countries subject to restrictive measure, who, by seeking protection of their funda fundamental rights, appropriate the values of the union and thus participate in its protection, as, for example, in the Rosneft judgment. As you will have understood for the purpose of this communication, Citizen appropriation may arise from litigation in which any litigant, except legal person um, or private um, uh, moral person, uh, seek to protect the value of the union. The choice of this broad definition of the subjects is justified by the fact that a stricter approach will not allow the interest of the subject, which is based on the question of whether the citizen in the contest of his litigation by making them his own, participates in the promotion and protection of values. The answer of this question, I think, is ambivalent. On the one hand, litigants are increasingly referring to the value of the union in the context to litigation, a practice that is encouraged by the Court of Justice and European institution. But on the other hand, the scope of the use of values is restricted, which has the effect of limiting the public impact of this uh, appropriation. This will be the two part of our presentation. A final uh, pre preliminary remark is necessary. The presence of the union values underlines the case law of the Court of Justice, through which it has developed as a European constitution constitutionalism, sorry. Nevertheless, for this contribution, we will concentrate on cases in which the values of Article 2 are expressly invoked. So first, let's look at how we encourage people to take to appropriate uh, values. The use of values by litigant is a recent development. However, since the beginning of 2010, and especially since 2015. Requests submitted by citizens have increasingly referred to the values to strengthen the judicial protection of their rights. They do so again both the union and the member states. Also litigation against the member state is more likely to involve citizens. The increase in the um, evocation of values is due to the condition that favor their appropriation which in practice have led citizens to assimilate the reasoning developed by the Court of Justice. This is due, the, uh, primarily, this is due to the political context in Poland and Hungary. There is no need to reiterate the facts which have been implied presented when about the, um, the crisis in Poland and in Hungary. 
to counter the degradation of democratic and the rule of law in these states, as political procedure at their limits, litigants have proved useful. On the, one, in the, on the one hand, it has been used by political institutions which are invoked Article 2 alone or in conjunction with other provisions of pre primary law to challenge a reform adopted by this government. Examples include cases concerning the violation of LGBT rights by Hungary and Poland or the independence of the justice which have led to infringement proceeding initiated by the Commission. On the other end, the Court of Justice, through its constructive, constructive case law, has established a link between the protection of value and other provisions of primary law. Firstly, independently of the response of the Hungarian and Polish crisis, the Court of Justice has established a link between the protection of fundamental rights and the protection <coughs> of the value set out in Article 2. The litigation of restrictive measures in this context is an example. Secondly, still outside the Hungarian and Polish cases, but with them in mind, the Court of Justice established a link between the protection of value and the protection of Article 19 of the TEU. In so doing, it objectified the litigation. It did so in two remarkable judgments arising from reference for preliminary ruling in which the values of the Union were not invoked by the referring court nor by the applicant in the main proceeding. These two judgments are the ASGP, uh, the Portuguese cases, Judge Portuguese cases, and the Republica judgment. Firstly, in ASGP, judgment take root from domestic proceeding brought by an association against budgetary measures reducing the remuneration of several office holders and persons exercing public function, function included <coughs> judges. In so doing, the Court of Justi Justice relied on the risk of undermining the independence of the judicial protection based on Article 19 and Article 47 um, of the Charter. However, even through the referring court and not invoke Article 2, the Court of Justice held that Article 19 give concrete form to Article 2 and thereby strengthen the link between the protection of the fundamental value of the union and Article 19. It follows from this judgment that member states are obliged to guarantee effective judicial protection, which includes, among other things, guarantees of independence and impartiality of judges. In the Republica case, the Court of Justice went even further by developing the concept of non-regression of the rule of law under Article 2. In this case, which was also brought by an association, association sorry, for the protection of justice and the rule of law in Malta, the Maltese court asked questions relating to the procedure for appointing ju judges, which has remained unchanged in the Maltese constitution since 1964. He asked whether the procedure was compatible with Article 19 and Article 2. <coughs> the court then states that under Article 49, the accession to the union is conditional of respect for the values set out in Article 2. This commitment to the union is conditional um, on this respect and accept by states give rise to a principle of non-regression as a result of which it cannot amend its legislation in such a way as to diminish the protection of the values of the rule of law. Will this ruling, the Court of Justice provides citizens with a legal basis and a, li a line of reasoning on which claim can be launched. Citizens will not fail to make use of them and demonstrate by the increasing number of cases in which values are invoked in support of their appeal. Indeed, the SSGP <coughs> case um, triggered an unceasing wave of court referral in Poland, Romania, Hungary, Malta, and even in Germany concern, concerning issues of judicial independence. 
in the space of a few years, a number of cases in which citizens have appropriated the value of the rule of law have led to ruling by the Court of Justice. Among the most recent are the Court of Justice judgment Associata Formul Judicatorilor di Romania, uh, in which an association of Romanian judges brought an action before the National Court concerning a decision relating <coughs> to the procedure for the effective promotion of judges to General Court and the Court of Appeal by replacing the all right and test uh, with an assessment of the candidate's work and conduct during the last three years of activity. There are a lot of other uh, judgments. At the same time, the invocation of failure to respect values has been enlightened in the suspension of the execution of European arrest warrant litigation. In the LM judgment, a Polish citizen who was the subject of three European arrest warrant did not consent to his surrender to the Polish authorities after he arrested in Ireland. In this opinion, there was a real risk that he would not receive a fair trial in Poland. In response to a pre preliminary sorry, ruling question, the Court of Justice states that a national court may refuse to execute a European arrest warrant on the ground of systemic or general failing in the independence of the judiciary. This possibility is strictly circumscribed as well we shall see later. Nevertheless, this just judgment enlightens the fact that citizens can use the failure to respect the value of the union, such, such as the rule of law or the protection of human dignity, it was the case in uh, Arangiosi judgment. And the European, <coughs> because the European arrest warrant is a system based on lo loyal cooperation, it's self-found on the principle of mutual trust, which implies that a member state respects the value of the union. If it's not, the cooperation mechanism can be suspended. This example, example could be multiplied. However, setting them out does not answer the question of why citizens turn to values, mainly to strengthen its argument in support of its own interest. However, insofar as their interests merge with the common interest of protecting values, it's allowed them to participate in promoting them. This purpose can sometimes even be consider considered as an intention. This is particularly the case when an application is made by an association whose corporate purpose is to protect justice, it's also the case when application comes from judges concerned about the operation of their legal system. In this respect, the Polish and Hungarian case are exemplary, with citizens taking part in the fight to European political institution and other member states to protect the rule of law. However, the practice that is developing in, the in this con context of this particular dispute as repercussion beyond that. Citizens are now inclined to invoke values as a tool for monitoring the institutions that are supposed to represent them. This supervision, which strengthens the power of the court, whether the court of justice or national court, is nevertheless framed by the procedural and substantive rules of litigation, which, as we shall see now, limit the scope of citizen appropriation of values. This limit to citizen appropriation of values stem on the one hand from the limited legal scope of values, which can nevertheless be circumvented, and the other hand, if I have time, I'm not sure, from, okay, I have no time for the second end, <laughs> but also of the condition of access to European courts. But for the first, um, only. The, to understand why values have a limited scope for litigation, we need to apply the theory of invocability to values. 
Invocability refers to the possibility for an individual to bring a case before a court in order to ask it on the basis of the values to interpret, it, interpret national or European law in accordance with the latter. This is now as invocability or interpretation. To substitute the values for the national or, or European law in question, this is known as the invocability of substitution. To set aside the national or European standard that is contrary to the values, invocability of ex exclusion, or finally to hold the state or the union li liable for violation of values, invocability of liability. Each of these invocabilities depend of certain conditions that are not met by the values. The invocability of ex exclusion and substitution will imply that the value act have, has direct effect, but it have not direct effect because they are too, too, too large, too abstract. The invocability of reparation need also like a condition of direct effect. Finally, the remain the invocability of interpretation, which does not impose any particular condition apart from not leading to an interpretation control again, citizen may invoke it without restriction. This limit, uh, limited invocability of values can nevertheless be circumvented by the use of norm of concretization. And they just use this reasonment. For the values of rule of law, which has been reconciled with Article 47 and Article 19 of the 47 of, Euro, of the Charter, Charter and uh, 19 of the Treaty. The Court of Justice also did so for the values of democracy in the Patricello Kate judgment and Quadrature Dunet um, judgment. More generally, uh, the Court of Justice establish a link between the values and the rights uh, in the Charter of Fundamental Rights in its judgment on the rule of law conditionality regulation. But the court need this concretization because the values are too abstract. And also, and I finish with that, it's interesting to see um, that the court use a structural principle Article 19 to enlarge the, the, the applica application, um, champ d'application, sorry, I don't have any, scope. the scope, scope of, of European law. They don't use it, they don't use fundamental rights because their scope are more, are little. And this, I think, have a meaning about um, for the citizen because the link between values and um, the protection of citizens is made by structural principle more than, than individual rights. So this limit, I think, this appropriation of uh, values by the citizen. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleague, for this very insightful presentation. I, have, mm, I would have many things to say, but that's not my role now. And if uh, Ms. Remlinger is ready, we should start uh, with you. Ms. Remlinger is a doctoral researcher in Paris, Panthéon Assas University, formerly Paris II. And uh, maybe that's because numbers count. So there is a Paris one. So now it's only Paris Panthéon Assas University. Um, but um, apart from this, I'm really happy to welcome you because you are uh, what we call in different uh, places the young research. And so I'm uh, really glad that uh, you can, uh, uh, that we can exchange views on your theme, which is the EU citizen's place in the process of concretization of the value of democracy. So the floor is yours, Ms. Remlinger. Thank you very much. I um, can manage without the PowerPoint, no problem. I'm fine. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Faster, and of course, I don't know. I will begin and okay. we should see. Yeah. Ah, yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you. All right. Just need to find uh, this is this one. Yeah. Um,
Thank that you very looks. Much. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to begin by thanking Professor Gael Marti. I'm very glad to be here. And uh, thank you to Yasin and Liz for the organization. Um, I'm glad to be here today to discuss a method found in the Court of Justice's case law that I will, re I will refer to as the method of concretization. Um, this method of interpretation has been developed by the courts to face the rule of law backslidings in some member states with two main purposes. To remedy the lack of definition of common values set out in Article 2 of the TEU and to remedy the failure to enforce the procedure enshrined in Article 7 of the TEU. This line of case law has been uh, developed by uh, Professor Foster, which I'm glad to because we, you will understand better my my uh, presentation with such insights. Um, so here's a quote from the Court of Justice's judgment on the rule of law conditionality regulation, which systematizes this method. To give a brief definition of the method based on this quote, I would say that concretization is a method used by the courts to define uh, the value set out in Article 2 of the TEU by combining this provision with other treaty provisions, which contains uh, legally binding principles to the member states. On the occasion of this judgment, the court considered that the values of Article 2 TEU can also be implement, implemented through secondary legislation. In that case, the legislator has to use the legal basis at it, at its disposal, sorry, um, as illustrated by the fact that the regulation protecting the rule of law was based on the protection of EU budget. But where do EU citizens fit in this process? That's a question I would like to try to answer today. And um, to begin with, I will say that EU citizens are not mentioned in Article 2 of the TEU, not directly mentioned, at least. Because according to this provision, uh, the union's values are common to the member states and provide for the foundations of the European Union. In both cases, citizens are not directly mentioned. And in a period where the content of the democratic value is questioned, we can therefore con consider that citizens are not key actors in this definition. I will, however, try to demonstrate that EU citizens could play a role in the concretization process of the value of democracy. In the Court of Justice's case law, which I will study in the first part, EU citizens have a quite passive role in the method because they seem to justify an enforcement of the value against member states. By comparison, the legislative enforcement of the value of democracy can appear as empowering EU citizens, as I will try to demonstrate by focusing on the recent proposal of a Media Freedom Act. So, December 2019 marked a decisive step in the Court of Justice's uh, case law and in, in its discourse on the democratic value. In Junqueras' judgments, the court showed how this value can be translated in, con in legally binding principles set out in the treaties. I will study this judgment to begin with before presenting briefly the prospects of the method. The case at hand, Junqueras, deals with the principle of representative democracy. In this judgment, the court uses the same method as the one used to concretize the rule of law which was combined with Article 19 of the TU. The logic is the following, as you can see on the board, values are given concrete expressions in principles, and these principles contain legally binding obligations for the member states, and that are opposable to the member states. In Yonkira, the court applies this method to the value of democracy. This value is concretized in the principle of representative democracy, set out in Article 10 of the TEU, 
And this principle contains the legally binding obligation found in Article 14, Paragraph 3 of the TEU. According to these provisions, the member of the European Parliament should be elected by direct universal suffrage. In the case at hand, the legal application of the norm of concretization results in a broad interpretation of EU law to the detriment of uh, uh, Spanish constitutional law. Because in this case, the use of the method enables the court to read broadly EU law to the benefits of members of the European Parliament's immu immunities. For a person, Mr. Junqueras, which wasn't to be considered as a member of the European Parliament according to Spanish law, so this application of Article 2 TU through interpretation was to be justified by the courts because it's a very large application of EU law. That is why I believe that this legal approach from the top, which is with the mobilization of Article 2 TU, is completed by the court with a non-legal argument from the bottom that is based on European citizens. In paragraph 83 that you can read on the board, the court affirms that in accordance with the principle of representative democracy, referred to in paragraph 63, which is a paragraph in which the court uses the method of concretization, and with article 14 of the TEU, the composition of the European Parliament must respect faithfully and completely the free expression of choices made by the citizens. Such a non-legal argument puts EU citizens at the basis of the concretization process. We can consider that it is a non-legal argument because the court doesn't even refer to the right to vote of EU citizens. I think we can see this justification of the enforcement of Article 2 TEU as a narrative of the court in which EU citizens are ultimately the most important subject and beneficiaries of EU law. But this discourse based on such a non-legal argument serves only to justify a broad interpretation of EU law. And in other words, the place of EU citizens in the concretization process, however symbolic, is quite passive. Nevertheless, this narrative potentially advocates for the broader applications of the theory developed in Young Curas. Um, oh, sorry. For example, Luc Dimitrius Picker uh, offered to extend this logic to control democratic requirements in the member states. He considers that Article 10, Paragraph 3 of the TEU is not limited to the EU democracy and could therefore enable EU citizens to contest national measures with regard to democratic standards. He considers that the combination of Article 2 and 10 of the TEU demonstrate a role of the EU to protect EU citizens against the member states. However, the process of concretization by the case law depends widely on the cases brought before the court. In this regard, a recent infringement procedure launched by the European Commission against Poland is interesting. This procedure concern, concerns the law which entered into force in May 2023 and which aims to create a state's committee to examine Russian influence on the internal security of Poland in the two last decades. The committee would have the power to determine if individuals acted under the influence of Russia in this period and therefore to deprive them of the right to hold public office for up to 10 years. Poland's opposition parties and the European Commission consider that this law is aimed at preventing some opposing figures to compete to the European elections or national elections. So for the first time, the European Commission launched an infringement procedure based, based on the combination of Article 2 and 10 of the TEU, which could lead the court to uh, apply the logic of Junqueras. However, the law was amended before it came into force and the last elections of October um, could influence the situation. So we shall wait and see what is the future of this procedure. 
To conclude the first part, we can therefore affirm that the method of concretization enables the court to define some aspects of the value of democracy by combining Article 2 TU to other treaty provisions. As we shall see, the legal basis for secondary legislation found in the treaties are different from the norms of concretization discovered by the court. In its European Democracy Action Plan presented in 2020, the Commission has presented several initiatives to uphold the value of democracy in its different components. As part of this plan, the Commission has presented a proposal of regulation for a Media Freedom Act. Therefore, I want to comment on this regulation to see how the EU legislator can concretize the value of democracy. On the one hand, we should see that the Commission bases its proposal on the harmonization of the internal market, which transforms EU citizens into purely economic actors. But on the other hand, we will see that the use of a regulation is interesting as it shall confer to its citizens an active role in the concretization of the value of democracy. The Media Freedom Act is based on Article 114 of the TFEU. It aims to protect pluralism and independence of media services in the internal market, which makes EU citizens the recipients of such services and not political actors. So there is a gap between the subject of this regulation, which concerns the internal market, and po the political purpose of its adoption. As I already underlined, the objective of this act is to uphold some aspects of the value of democracy. This objective is clearly stated by the European Commission. Moreover, when we read the opinions and amendments made by the organs and institutions during the legislative procedure, we can see that this objective is commonly accepted and admitted. In other words, the use of Article 114 of the TFEU to define some aspects of the value of democracy is not contested in its principle. However, we can note that the present version, as amended by the European Parliament, um, is less value-centered than the conditionality regulation was. Um, in other words, the conditionality regulation was more explicitly uh, devoted to the protection of the values, the value of the rule of law, sorry. Still, the European Media Freedom Act contains a reference to European values in its second recital, in which the European Parliament also introduced a reference to freedom of expression as the basis of a democratic society. If the Media Freedom Act is adopted as such, it means that the Court of Justice will be able to interpret its provisions with regard to the value of democracy. Indeed, in that case, the Court will be competent to interpret the regulation on the occasion of preliminary references or infringement cases, and the Court could then read the provisions of this regulation in the light of its recitals and with the purpose of finding concrete expressions of the value of democracy in it. But, as I already underlined, this is not very satisfactory to rely on the Court of Justice to implement the value of democracy. One, because it can take a lot of time. Two, because this EU institution can lack legitimacy to do so. And three, because EU citizens don't take an active part in this concretization. So to summarize this first section, the adoption of the Media Freedom Act aims at protecting the value of democracy, but EU citizens are given a purely economic status in this act. 
Yet, the stated objective of the Democracy Action Plan is to empower EU citizens to build more resilient democracies. That's why I want to show in my last section, which will be very brief, that the choice of the instruments could give an active role to EU citizens in that regard. I believe that EU citizens could find an active role in the concretization of the value of democracy with this Media Freedom Act because it is a regulation. The choice of such an instrument has two consequences that are underlined by the European Commission in the explanatory memorandum attached to the initiative. First of all, it enables EU law to be applied with uniformity among the member states. Contrary to the directive, a regulation reduces regulatory disparities because between the member states. Secondly, and it is the most important here, the present for the present presentation, sorry, regulations allow for the effectiveness of EU law that has been already mentioned. It is here that EU citizens are empowered. Indeed, and it has been mentioned also since Van Gennen lost ruling in 1963, citizens of the Union have been regarded as subjects of the Union law. They are therefore guarantors of the effectiveness of EU law since they can invoke standards with direct effect be, be, sorry, before any national court. And in principle, the provisions of a regulation are of, I have such an effect. Thus, if the regulation is adopted and if the national court considers that its provision have a direct effect, Union citizens will be able to request that the regulation be justifiable before them. This is in keeping with the functionalist logic that Mathieu mentioned earlier, that end up in the constriction of the internal market, even though they are merely considered as economic actors in this legislation, EU citizens can, can could play an active role in guaranteeing the effectiveness of this regulation. They could therefore play a role in the upholding of the value of democracy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Remlinger. Already a big shot, or at least uh, she proves to become one because she was uh, perfectly um, on the schedule so, and even uh, finished before, so that's great. Uh, now we are moving on um, to our colleague uh, Eden Cohn, who is an associate professor of political science. So, um, may I say, not a lawyer, not a jurist, you but you are very much welcome here. And she comes not far from here, from the University of Grenoble Alpes, and also Sciences Po Grenoble. And she's going to talk about bringing values back in a comparative study of citizens' European narratives. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Oh, is that okay? Yeah. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Gail Marty and the organizers of the conference for having uh, invited me, even though, as uh, it has been said, I'm not a lawyer but a political scientist. So, but working directly on, uh, on this um, issue of uh, uh, European citizenship and, and the relations with the European values. So I would like to present today um, um, an article that is in progress that we are currently writing from uh, um, a field work that has been done in 2018, 2019. Uh, in which we organized uh, a lot of discussions with uh, European citizens. I will, of course, go back to this. So it's an article uh, that is written with uh, Laurie Baudonnet, who is at uh, the Centre Jean Monnet in Montreal, Céline Belot uh, at Sciences Po Grenoble and PACT, and uh, myself. Um, the goal, what we want to do here, is to understand how European citizens uh, make sense of the EU, and what uh, roles, uh, what role narratives plays in in, uh, in their attitudes toward uh, European integration? 
So we say that uh, one should not only focus on officials and elites narratives, which has been studied a lot in, in political science, but also on the stories citizens tell to make sense of the European reality, which is something that has been uh, less developed in, in the literature, and so here is uh, our, our contribution. Um, so we start from the idea that political narratives give sense to communities and politics by providing sense, explanation, and allocation of responsibility uh, for political actions, and are thus central uh, to understand better the relationship between citizens and the different levels of government. Um, so we... we we, we aim to uh, identify what were the most uh, important uh, political narratives for the citizens. It was a first paper that was uh, already published, and now we wanted to link also the idea of these uh, political narratives and to see how do they relate to European values and if, uh, if there are conflicts also uh, between the narratives and the different values assigned to different narratives. So we did so with a comparative qualitative study uh, by analyze, analyzing focus group which were carried out uh, during the last uh, European elections um, in uh, Belgium, France, Italy and Portugal. Uh, the main uh, findings of uh, this research is that citizens really go beyond the cost-benefit calculation and that they rely on values both to envision uh, the European project but also to evaluate uh, the European outputs of uh, the EU. And we know that uh, three clusters of value emerge. I will, of course, present uh, these clusters a, a little bit later. Uh, with, uh, and these clusters of values are associated and sometimes conflicting with political narratives. So maybe I will go a little, I, tr I try to be uh, not very long on this one, uh, about the attitudes towards Europe and uh, to know what are the factors uh, and conditions of, uh, that really determine the attitudes of citizens towards Europe. So of course we have this um, explanation about the Itali uh, utilitarian support, but also other fields of literature based more on identity, um, personal identity, national identity, and the ability to mobilize a uh, cognitive frame uh, to, 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 to better understand uh, a political system. So to put it broadly, uh, these various theories can be distinguished uh, along these uh, two main dimensions, uh, utilitarian versus identity-related explanations. So on the one hand, we have this uh, utilitarian theory uh, gr that grants support for European integration mainly on the material uh, benefits of European integration, and it has been proven uh, consistent. But on the other hand, uh, inclusiveness or exclusiveness of one's identity has been also shown to be crucial in the formation or lack of support uh, for Europe. So this literature, uh, which has been uh, developed using mostly only quantitative data, joins, joins another stream uh, of research interested in how input legitimacy, so everything that enters the system, and it's more linked to uh, democratic procedures, elections, participations uh, of uh, European citizens to uh, the, the political system, and on the other hand, output legitimacy or throughput legitimacy, uh, which affect uh, citizens' disaffection for European integration. So in this paper, we aim at building on these two scholarships by re-questioning the input versus output uh, source of citizen support through observing the narratives uh, with which they make sense of the EU. And we propose to do so to, to contribute to this perspective by highlighting the role of individuals' values in their perception of what kind of political project the EU is and uh, should be. 
So values um, uh, has important input to any political project are keys to understand how citizens perceive and reflect on the EU's purpose and project. And they may also constitute standards while uh, evaluating the political system, um, thus participating to build uh, output legitimacy or highlighting the lack of uh, output legitimacy in cases where these standards uh, are not met. So, uh, of course, output legitimacy can be very diverse and above all can substantially affect the way citizens evaluate the European project. I just give you an example of two kind of output legitimacies of, of the EU, uh, peace on the one hand and free roaming on the other hand. So they can be uh, considered as two kind of outputs of uh, European integration, but of course they may not have the same impact on uh, citizens' perceptions of uh, legitimacy of the, of the EU. So this is uh, the literature on which we build uh, this, um, this paper. Um, so values they are considered uh, as central features of a political project. The definition of values remain, uh, remain diverse and there is no collective understanding of our list of definitive values that we can uh, look and find in the discourses uh, of uh, political elites or uh, citizens. In this paper, we do not analyze how individuals develop political values of their own, uh, but rather we look at which values they attach to specific uh, political project and how values interfere uh, with the evaluation of this political project. So we look at narratives to see how their understanding of political narratives are linked to specific values and our approach is more inductive, so we did not seek to evaluate the role of predetermined uh, specific values in citizen discourse, but rather to operationalize a definition of values that would be helpful to identify values in the corpus of the discussions uh, of the focus group. So to do so, we rely on the literature in uh, social psychology, electoral behavior and European studies, where values are a central concept nowadays in analyzing enlargement, foreign policy, and more generally European policy making. So in the broadest sense, and according to Schwartz, uh, I quote him, uh, values refer to des des desirable goals that motivate action, Values guide the selection or evaluation of actions, policies, people, and events. People de decide what is good or bad, justified or illegitimate, worth doing or, or avoiding, based on possible consequences for their cherished values. Because um, values are central in how individuals assess political action and political regimes, they constitute a, a relevant entry to analyze how citizens confront the purpose of the EU and the evaluation of its uh, achievements. Um, maybe, yeah, I would like to, to, to say a brief word on, uh, on narratives and how we define narratives in this research. So we consider that uh, political narratives are stories that provide explanation, justification, and responsibility. So how do we translate this uh, to the EU uh, level or discussion about uh, the EU? Um, so uh, we look at, uh, at a narrative in, in the corpus as long as we could find a story with a purpose, causality, a plot that articulates events together and that involve characters, or we could say actors, and a temporality. So that's quite um, a, um, a demanding definition of political narratives because we wanted to distinguish a political project from the narratives and we were interested in, in the narratives more, more specifically. So what is the story or the meaning behind the European project, behind European integration from the citizen's perspective. Um, it seems that um, 
with the decline of what we could call the, the ever closer union narrative, studies focused on alternative narratives uh, show that, they, that new narratives also emerged in the last uh, years and uh, that it also changed with uh, the kind of politicization of some of the sectors of uh, European uh, policies and also the specific economic and, and social crisis uh, at the end of the 2000s. So we want to bridge uh, um, these two uh, literatures together uh, to, to, to disentangle the role of, uh, of values uh, and how do citizens assign values to specific uh, narratives. So here on the left, I, I, I put the definitions that we kept from um, narratives and, and values. And what we wanted to do is, or what we did actually, is that we organized a semi-structured group discussion. So we had, uh, we had like 21 uh, focus groups led from uh, March to June 2009 in four cities, uh, Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium, Grenoble in France, Lisbon in Portugal, and Florence in Italy. And some of the focus group discussions were held as a sequential focus group, so we met three times with these various groups of uh, people, especially the seniors, but we also have like a one-shot focus group with other groups of people. So the idea was to observe um, the, the role of uh, social, economic and social characteristics of uh, the citizens and also to evaluate the role of the, of, uh, the campaign effect on their discussion because we had, for the second Charles uh, focus group, we had one uh, way before the election, just before the election and after the results of the election. And the aim was also, of course, to, to look at the effect of the campaign on the political discussions. So these groups were um, uh, also constructed uh, with the idea of um, kind of homogeneous uh, factors or variables uh, within the group, uh, mo mostly about uh, their sociological dimensions. Uh, age generation, so we had focus group with seniors, middle-aged people, and, and young people, but also with different status from uh, in different focus group, uh, different employment status. Uh, we had students, employees, unemployed, uh, different level of education in different focus group, and um, a kind of um, international internal uh, homogeneity in terms of political knowledge within the different groups, but also different political attitudes or, poly, uh, or, or partisan proximity among the citizens in, 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 one, uh, in one group. So the research design, what we did with, uh, with the citizens, it was, uh, as I said, semi-structured uh, group discussion. So we had like very general questions. Um, uh, each focus group uh, lasted approximately two hours and a half to three hours. So we discussed, or they discussed with uh, uh, together for two and a half uh, hours at least. We had like uh, general questions on the most important uh, political issues that they see without asking about Europe, without asking about the levels of government, we only wanted to see what were the main uh, political issues for them at the moment, and also what they thought about who should be in charge of these uh, issues uh, or public policies. And then we moved to more uh, specific question, uh, questions on European integration, about uh, the idea of uh, leaving or remaining in the EU, about the winners and losers of uh, European integration. And we also had uh, a last phase during the sequential uh, focus groups, uh, more specifically on the narratives or the visions of Europe, in which we prompt the citizens with cartoons or uh, sentences from uh, political parties that were made during the campaign. So one important point is that, of course, we assign different, um, we do not assign the same explanation when citizens give their own narratives in the 
um, in the first phases of the, of the focus group, then in the last phase where we really prompt them with cartoons on more uh, conflictual issues such as immigration, social Europe, and, and so on. Um, from that, we uh, coded uh, the full corpus of this uh, 21 uh, focus group. So we started with the full corpus and, have, uh, and we, ha we had a first coding, uh, which is uh, based on uh, the series uh, about, so a first coding in which we identify the projects and the, the European projects and uh, European narratives when they were part of what uh, citizens said about the project. So we, had, we came out with a sub-sample with only the sentences or the parts of the discussions that were dedicated to the European project. And then we had a second uh, phase of coding uh, in which we tried to identify different values but not with a, more with an inductive approach, uh, reading uh, the, the discussions and, and highlighting where we would uh, find uh, values. So it led to another subsample uh, of uh, values with uh, 900 segments. And we are now, um, so we ended up with a, a final uh, corpus mm -hmm. in which we have these narratives and the values that are assigned to different narratives. And we are uh, right now in, uh, um, in the process of doing a third coding in which we are more interested in the conflicts between the values in the narratives uh, that, they, that they gave. Okay, so I will, uh, so uh, findings. Um, we identify three main clusters. The first one is about openness, hospitality, uh, humanism, and which it uh, represents approximately 20% of the subsample. A second cluster, which is about sharing and balance, materialism, liberalism, and solidarity, which is more important in the, in the sample. And a third cluster on democracy, unity, and diversity, which is comparable to the first one. And um, uh, so these clusters are the ones that are the most structured with narrative elements um, uh, in, in, our, in our corpus. And they are present, these clusters are present in all focus groups, uh, more or less directly linked to political narratives. So uh, for, the first, uh, for the first one, and maybe I won't have time to develop the three clusters, but I would like to give you at least an example on the first one. Uh, so it's about openness, hospitality, and humanism. So the baseline of the narrative is about the space with borders, a territory with borders that are more or less open, and of course, mobility and uh, Schengen. And here we can find two rival narratives, one about uh, a fortress Europe, uh, that, so an Europe that is uh, less uh, open, uh, but that could also um, uh, uh, bring uh, specific issues on how we live together, how citizens live together, and about solidarity uh, between, the between the member states even more than between uh, European citizens. And a, a second one, which is about a humanist Europe, which is uh, more open and has a humanism as a core value. Um, so also uh, responsibility beyond the, the European territory and the responsibility of Europe in the world uh, more uh, globally. Um, so, for example, the idea of uh, the narrative of Fortress Europe is more discussed uh, among seniors. That doesn't mean that they share this narrative, but it is more discussed uh, among a seniors' uh, focus group. But the responsibility sometimes is not framed in the same way. For example, um, it really directly relates to humanism and human rights for the seniors, whereas for younger participants, uh, this narrative of Fortress Europe was more linked to decolonization, uh, exploitation uh, of the rich or regions over the poorest regions uh, in the world. And so we can find conflict also within uh, a, a shared uh, narrative. Maybe, so I will go back 
to, I can uh, answer questions on the two other clusters because I won't have time to develop them right now. Uh, but to conclude, we can say that value, uh, values are really used to, has a standard for evaluation of the output of the European uh, Union, that we can find a variety of narratives. Of course, we find the, the political elites' narratives in, in citizen discourse, but they also have their own narrative and they reframe and reconstruct uh, the political or the official uh, narratives. Uh, and they have a real demand for uh, an EU as a polity um, uh, citizens in which they would have uh, their say and in which they could also uh, publicly engage in normative uh, calculation. So we still uh, have things to do on this uh, paper, especially as I said, we are in, uh, in, the, in, in the phase of doing a third coding, uh, uh, more, in, more linked to the conflicts of, uh, between values. Um, and I think that's it, and I will end, it, uh, end up here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, very fascinating presentation. And I understood from uh, your storytelling that your work is mainly about coding. And somehow I was told, thanks to a book, published two or three years ago that code is low. So in mm -hmm. a way, you, we can say you're a lawyer. <laughs> and I also like the last image because you spoke about the fortress Europa, but also about humanist Europe. So maybe we are living in an open fortress. And I would be happy to have this image in mind for the, the end of the day. Um, OK, now it's about coffee break. I'm looking at the organizer. Do you allow some questions or do we? Postpone. Yeah, we have a question at the end of the student session for everyone. Uh, the students are invited to the coffee break which is in the Salon de Cambol uh, for 20 minutes, I don't know. It was 20 minutes, and if we want to be on schedule, it's about seven minutes. Okay. So. <laughs> we can take the, the 20 minutes to have the okay. coffee break, and then we can ask directly if you want to the people who are uh, questions, in French, because they are. Okay. You're welcome. Thanks to the panelists Thank for this very, very insightful uh, presentation. And so back in 20 minutes after the coffee break. <laughs>